After one decade since the discovery of the electron was announced, the idea of subatomic particles was still not completely accepted. This is the story of the experiment that changed that. In 1897, J.J. Thomson published his groundbreaking research on cathode rays, demonstrating that these rays are in fact a stream of particles that we now call electrons. He measured the motion of electrons under electric and magnetic fields and showed how the amount of deflection from a straight path allows a direct estimate of its mass-to-charge ratio. Thomson found the electron's mass-to-charge ratio to be over a thousand times smaller than the smallest known mass ratio, corresponding to hydrogen ions. Side note here, if you read old papers, you will find the bad habit back then of reporting quantities without units. In SI units, the value 10 to the minus 7 found by Thomson is close to 6 times 10 to the minus 12 kilograms per coulomb. Without knowing the mass or the charge independently, there is no way to know whether the mass is very small or if the charge is very large or anything in between. If only any of these two quantities could be isolated and experimentally measured, then the subatomic nature of the electron could be directly addressed. The race was on. On each side of the Atlantic, physicists designed new experiments and developed methods to measure the electron's charge. The protagonist of today's story is an American physicist, as formidable for his experimental abilities as controversial for his political influence within the physics community. Robert Millikan received his doctorate in 1895 and then moved to Germany to master experimental physics in Berlin and Göttingen. Millikan's scientific hero was Albert Michelson, famous for his precision instruments and later for the historic Michelson-Morley experiment. Michelson invited Millikan back to the US to join him at a newly established lab at the University of Chicago, where Millikan became an assistant professor and reproduced many of the key experiments performed in Europe, in particular those by J.J. Thomson in England. One general idea to measure the total electric charge of a small object, like a water droplet, was designed by Erich Regener, a student of Rubens. Remember Rubens? He proposed to suspend an electrically charged droplet against its own weight using an electric field. In this way, a negatively charged droplet on a uniform electric field directed down would experience an electric force in the opposite direction. By adjusting the magnitude of the electric field, a perfect balance between this force and the weight of the droplet allows determining its total electric charge. Unfortunately, this requires precisely knowing the droplet's size and achieving an exquisite level of precision to maintain the droplet in balance. Millikan came up with a clever alternative in which a droplet is not suspended at rest, but rather allowed to fall, quickly reaching terminal velocity due to drag from the surrounding air, and then pushed up at a constant speed using the electric force. By adjusting the magnitude of the electric field, a single droplet could be made go up and down in a controlled manner. Although the droplet is moving, its constant speed implies no acceleration, so all forces are still in equilibrium. As I will show you in a minute, this constant up and down motion allows a direct estimate of the droplet's total electric charge. A significant experimental challenge was to be able to see the droplets to measure their motion. A little chamber produced a cloud of droplets that would quickly fall, but the process was so fast that the droplets to be studied using a telescope only stayed in the field of view for a couple of seconds and quickly evaporate. This was not enough time to adjust the electric field and to make accurate measurements, rendering Millikan's ingenious experimental setup useless. He assigned a young graduate student named Harvey Fletcher the problem of finding the right liquid to perform the experiment. Fletcher had a bachelor degree in physics, but after arriving in Chicago for his doctorate, the university decided that he should redo several years of coursework. After presenting all the paperwork and being ignored by the admissions committee, he was about to give up when Millikan came to his rescue. After validating Fletcher's competence and his physics knowledge, Millikan used his strong influence so that Fletcher only had to take some selected courses and delayed his doctoral work only one year. Millikan also helped him to get extra funding, for which Fletcher had to take care of the lantern projectors using some classes. In 1909, Fletcher was looking for a thesis problem 
when Millikan explained the issue of the evaporating water droplets. We discussed ways and means of getting around the difficulty. Mercury, oil, and two other or three substances were suggested. Then Professor Millikan said to me, there is your thesis. Go try one of these substances which will not evaporate. Fletcher studied the behavior of different liquids and his experience fixing lantern projectors helped him build his own devices to make measurements. One afternoon, he stopped by a drugstore and bought watch oil and an atomizer, like those from vintage perfume bottles. He thought that this would be a good way to produce tiny droplets of oil. The atomizer produced a spray of droplets, some of them electrically charged due to friction, which would fall several centimeters reaching terminal velocity before entering the measurement region within two horizontal metal plates about two centimeters apart. The top plate had a small hole in the middle for some droplets to go through. In the absence of an electric field between the plates, the droplets simply fall at a constant rate. When the field is switched on by connecting the plates to a significant voltage, then a uniform electric field appears with the magnitude given by the voltage divided by the separation between the plates. By adjusting the voltage, the electric field could be controlled. Fletcher tested his improvised experiment by connecting the plates to a 1000 volt battery. As I looked through the telescope, I could see the tiny stream of oil droplets coming through the hole. As soon as I turned on the switch, some of them went slowly up, some went faster down. By switching the field off and on with the right timing, one could keep a selected droplet in the field of view for a long time. The next day, Fletcher brought Milligan to the lab to show him the results. Milligan was thrilled and played with the droplets for a long time. He dropped everything else he was working on and called his technician. He had been waiting for this moment and knew exactly what was next. They needed an improved version of Fletcher's apparatus with better plates and needed the measurement chamber to be airtight to avoid any spurious effect from external forces. Milligan also wanted a higher voltage between the plates and to have droplets with more charge, for which he requested a radium source or an X-ray machine to ionize the air around the droplets. This led to the final experiment that Millikan had had in mind for a long time. Let's see how Millikan wanted to determine the electric charge by making use of the falling and rising oil droplets. There are two configurations for the experiment depending on whether the electric field is turned on or off. In the field off phase, a given droplet simply falls, experiencing the action of two forces its weight and the drag of the air around in the direction opposite to its motion. This drag is proportional to the speed denoted here by V down. The equilibrium condition is valid because the droplet falls at a constant rate. During the field on phase, the voltage is adjusted so that the droplet rises at a constant speed and experiences three forces. Its weight, the electrostatic force pointed up, assuming that the charge is negative, and the drag force, which now points down because it opposes the motion and has a magnitude proportional to the rising speed denoted here by V up. The equilibrium conditions of the two phases can be combined to write QE in terms of the mass of the droplet and the two speeds. For determining the mass, we write it as density times volume. Assuming a spherical symmetry, the mass becomes a simple function of the droplet's radius. Fletcher and Millikan considered the state of the droplet during the field off phase so that the equilibrium condition becomes an equation for the radius r. On the right hand side, they use a relation known as Stokes' law. This law establishes that the proportionality constant of the drag force is k equals 6 pi times eta times the radius, where eta is the viscosity of the air. From here we can easily solve for r. Plugging this result back, we have eliminated the mass and now we have the charge on the droplet given only in terms of fixed constants, experimental variables, and experimental observables. I should mention here that for simplicity, I have ignored the buoyancy of the droplet. However, the droplets can be so small that this effect cannot be neglected. If you redo the calculation, you will find that the only change to the formula found here is a shift on the droplet's density by the Earth's density. This is the exact formula used by Millikan and Fletcher. All that is needed is to get some oil droplets and adjust the voltage to measure the speed up and the speed down to get the charge. This is really clever, and Millikan had a reason for the droplet moving in both directions. 
From his vast experience doing precision experiments, he knew that this back and forth motion would help remove sources of error. The measurements obtained by Fletcher and Millikan were in fact so precise that later they were forced to use a more advanced form of the Stokes law. Millikan called his technician and asked him for full dedication to this project, and a week after Fletcher first controlled oil droplets, a new and more advanced device was completed. During the following weeks, Fletcher and Millikan spent every afternoon in the lab making measurements. Weeks turned into months. They mastered the art of spraying droplets, selecting one, and then controlling its falling and rising. They measured the motion of a single droplet several times. By making it go up and down, the droplet could exchange charges with the surrounding ionized air, which they could clearly observe as sudden changes in speed. These sudden changes were what Millikan was after. Remember that the goal was determining the charge of the electron. Millikan didn't care about the total charge of a particular droplet. He wanted to measure how this charge changed or the different charge that a single droplet could have. The hypothesis was that if a minimum amount of charge existed, then all charges measured would be an integer multiple of this fundamental charge, revealing the charge of the electron. And this was exactly what they found. Between December 1909 and May of 1910, Mr. Harvey Fletcher and myself took observations in this way upon hundreds of drops and found in every case the original charge on the drop an exact multiple of the smallest charge which we found that the drop cut from the air. What Millikan is saying here is that they observed all droplets change their total charge by capturing new charges from the ionized air but always in multiples of a fixed minimum quantity. They found what they called the smallest quantity of electricity capable of separate existence to be 4.891 times 10 to the minus 10 electrostatic units or 1.631 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Milligan did it. His cleverly designed experiment led to a direct measure of the charge of the electron using a device that can be easily replicated. The simplicity of the Fletcher Millikan apparatus is such that the oil drop is an standard experiment performed by undergraduate students of physics all over the world. The determination of the electron's charge also allowed estimating many other fundamental parameters in molecular chemistry, including Avogadro's number. Millikan's triumph measuring the charge of the electron also led to a definite estimate of the electron's mass from the mass to charge ratio. Using the measurements of Thomson and Fletcher Millikan, we get a mass close to 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. This mass is about 1000 times smaller than the smallest atom. The result of the oil drop experiment finally confirmed that the electron is indeed a subatomic particle. Fletcher began drafting a manuscript describing all the technical aspects of the device, the improvements, and its application to measure the electric charge of droplets as well as the incorporation of the modified version of Stokes' law. Together they had drafted a total of five articles on different aspects of the experiments and even other possible measurements with the same device like the precise observation of Brownian motion. All the time, Fletcher was excited to see his name next to the great Robert Millikan, especially on the first paper, which both knew it was for the history books. But one day, after writing most of the historic first paper, Fletcher was at his home when he received a visit from Millikan, who told him that for his doctorate, a single author paper was needed. Millikan wanted to be the only author of the first article, and Fletcher could later author some of the other papers in preparation. Fletcher didn't like this. He did most of the work and most of the writing. He was very disappointed, but accepted and never again talked about this during his life. Millikan did acknowledge Fletcher's contribution on his now historic paper published in 1911, but not including him as an author made Fletcher's name just a footnote. A second paper describing even more improvements to the device and more precise measurements, published in 1913, after Fletcher's graduation, made this experiment one of the most famous in the history of modern physics. Millikan didn't even mention Fletcher in the text. Harvey Fletcher received his doctorate in 1911 and had a successful career as a teacher and then as a researcher at Bell Labs, the paradise of innovation for scientists. Fletcher developed new technologies for telephone communications and became a leading expert in acoustics. 
He invented devices for improving hearing aids, as well as the first recording of stereo sound, crucial for TV and films, which gave him a posthumous Technical Grammy Award in 2016. We know all the details of the fletcher millikan relationship today, because Fletcher wrote a fascinating article about this, which he requested to be published only after his death. Robert Millikan was already a respected physicist in 1811, but his paper reporting the measurement of the electron's charge made him a celebrity in the world of experimental physics. He erased any doubt that the electron was indeed a subatomic particle, a discovery that made him a strong candidate for the Nobel Prize and even started a new field in physics. Despite his controversial ways of working, his ego and his interest in fame and recognition, Millikan was a brilliant scientist ready to take on another challenge, one that he had been working in parallel for years. Stop what he considered the nonsense of quanta of light by proving that Einstein was wrong. Thanks again to the several viewers for the general support on Coffee and via Super Thanks. Remember that by liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing you also contribute to the growth of the channel.